Good evening. I am Dr. Peter Larson, Chair of the UCF History Department. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the eighth annual Gerald H. Schaffner Lecture on Florida Culture and History. Professor Schaffner was a leader in Florida history, as well as longtime chair of the UCF History Department, and he did much to develop our programs. Thus, we are honored to host this event in his memory. Thank you to all of you who are joining us by Zoom or YouTube tonight. This event and its streaming are made possible thanks to the work of two of the department staff, Tiffany Rivera, Director of Educational and Training Programs, and Administrative Assistant Kayla Campana. Together, they're overseeing the production of this event and the Q&A that will follow. The Florida Historical Quarterly and the UCF chapter of the Phi Alpha Theta National History Honor Society are co-sponsors of the Schaffner Lecture, and we are grateful for their continuing support. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Connie Lester, Associate Professor of History, Editor of the Florida Historical Quarterly, and the organizer of tonight's event. Dr. Lester? Good evening. Welcome to the eighth annual Gerald Schaffner Lecture on Florida History and Culture. Let me say just a few words about the lecture and its origins. The lecture series is an outreach of the Florida Historical Quarterly, which is the peer-reviewed scholarly publication of the Florida Historical Society. The offices for the quarterly are in the de history department here at UCF. The society headquarters are in Cocoa. The Florida Historical Quarterly is in its 99th volume of publication and came to UCF from the University of Florida in the mid 1990s. Dr. Schaffner was the first editor at UCF and the lecture series was named to honor his contributions to Florida history, his work as editor, his scholarship and his service as a past president of the society. Dr. Schaffner attended the inaugural lecture in 2013, but unfortunately his health did not permit him to be present for any of the other lectures. On April the 11th, 2017, he passed away. The lecture has continued to grow. And this year for the first time, we are offering a virtual lecture and welcoming a scholar whose scholarship is not focused primarily on Florida history, but whose research shapes the way we think about race and gender in Florida. There are several people we need to thank. Organizing an event is never the work of one individual. As Dr. Larson has already indicated, we want to thank Phi Alpha Theta, the Department of History, and the College of Arts and Humanities who partnered with the Florida Historical Quarterly to make the lectures possible. There are a number of individuals who deserve special thanks as well. In the Dean's office, Heather Gibson, Carol Robertson, and Azella Santana. In the Center for Humanities and Research, Dr. Mike Shire. In the History Department, Sarah Ambrosecchio, Amira Bacchus, Tiffany Rivera, Kayla Campagna, and Jeffrey Cabrero. Finally, our community partners who helped to publicize the event, thank you all. One little bit of housekeeping for those on Zoom. During the course of the lecture, please enter your questions into the Q&A feature. At the close of the lecture, we will take as many of the questions as time permits. And now, Dr. Fawn Gordon, an associate professor in the Department of History and director of Africana Studies will introduce our speaker. Thank you, Dr. Lester. Good evening. I am very pleased to introduce Professor Martha S. Jones. She is professor of history and the Society of Black Alumni Presidential Professor at the Johns Hopkins University. Professor Jones is the author of Birthright Citizens, A History of Race and Rights in Antebellum America, published in 2018. The title won three different awards for the best book in civil rights history, the best book in American legal history, and the best book in, in Anglo-American legal history. Her most recent work published last month 
is Vanguard, how Black women broke barriers, won the vote, and insisted on equality for all. The title of her presentation this evening is The Right to Vote, Women and Race in the 1920 Election. Please welcome Professor Martha S. Jones. Good evening. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Gordon, for the kind introduction. Um, thank you to Dr. Peter Larson in the History Department at the University of Central Florida. Thank you especially to Dr. Connie Lester and the Florida Historical Quarterly um, for ensuring um, that I could be with you all this evening. Um, it's an honor to participate in um, the tradition of the Schaffner Lecture um, and I um, look forward to our discussion at the end. My theme this evening is indeed the 19th Amendment to the US Constitution. Um, and one reflection on how we mark the centennial um, moving in a sense, I think from a number of myths that surround the 19th Amendment to um, some of its very important history. Um, the story of the amendment is without a doubt one facet of our national reckoning with the past, especially a reckoning with the role that racism has played in shaping our nation. And my hope is that through this opportunity to better understand what happened in 1920, um, we can better move forward from today. Now, if you mention to me that you're celebrating the 19th amendment, you might notice um, a slight cringe don't get me wrong, I've just finished a book about the history of black women in the vote. And so I'm as interested in, as anyone in this anniversary its significance to the nation's past. And still, I can't quite bring a spirit of celebration to the occasion. It might get in the way of the story I have to tell. When we appreciate what an open secret black women's ongoing disenfranchisement was in 1920, the facts of the 19th Amendment fit only awkwardly with events that feature light shows, period costumes, and marching bands. In 1920, members of Congress who promulgated the 19th Amendment, state lawmakers who ratified it, and suffragists themselves all understood that nothing in its terms would prohibit states from strategically using poll taxes, literacy tests, and understanding clauses to keep Black women from registering to vote. Nothing in the new amendment promised to curb the intimidation and violence that threatened black women who came out to polling places. Voting rights and voter suppression went hand in hand in 1920. Now I'm a historian and fortunately for me and perhaps for you, nothing in my job requires me to plan commemoration festivities. Instead, my role is to cut through the half truths and myths about the past and equip us with critical tools for thinking about the future of our democracy. 25 years ago, historian Michelle Rolf Trio looked back on the celebration that marked 500 years since 1492, the year in which Christopher Columbus was once have said to have discovered the Americas. Trio warned against historians becoming too drawn into promoting the sanitized partial truths and even myths that the occasion demanded. The difficult history of European contact and conquest with the indigenous people of the Americas, including that of Columbus was muted and even omitted altogether in efforts to cast that anniversary as a celebration. Those framings may have filled the coffers of tourist venues and souvenir sellers, but they did too little to promote critical insight of how into how colonialism devastated the people of the lands of the hemisphere, the people and the lands of the hemisphere. So when I'm asked about why I've stayed home from the celebrations, I'll note that the centennial of the 19th amendment marks a milestone in the American story of voting rights. I'll add that remembering that era of voter suppression may help us see more clearly how ballots are being withheld from Americans in our own time. It may even encourage us to recommit to the ongoing work of ensuring the voting rights of all Americans. And I'm eager to contribute the stories of black women to our collective memory of the 19th amendment. But as a nation, we're not quite yet ready for that grand celebration. The promise of voting rights for all still remains out on the horizon. 
So let's return to what happened in August 1920 when the 19th Amendment became part of the Constitution. And our conversation this evening will turn on two principal myths. The first myth is that when the 19th Amendment became law, all American women won the vote. You might even hear people say that the 19th Amendment guaranteed to American women the right to vote. That's myth one. At the same time, there is circulating a second myth that runs almost counter to the first. Um, and that is that no black American women gained the vote in 1920, that racism continued to keep all black women from the polls. So in this anniversary year, it's time to replace history with myth. And let's look at what happened in August of 1920 when the US Secretary of State certified that the 19th Amendment was now part of the US Constitution. It had been ratified by the required 36 states. The text read, the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or any state on account of sex. So what precisely did that mean for American women? Now laws that reserved the ballot for men violated the constitution. Those state statutes that imposed a sex requirement, male onto voting rights were no longer enforceable. And still the 19th amendment did not promise women the vote and laws, state laws still kept many American women from the polls based upon age, citizenship, residency, mental competence. In 1920, it was still true that American women who married non-US citizens were denaturalized. They lost their citizenship and their right to vote. The women who showed up to register in the fall of 1920 confronted many, many hurdles, even if sex was no longer one of them. Now, one additional barrier to women's votes persisted even after a federal amendment, and that was racism. It was true that the 15th Amendment in 1870 had expressly forbid states from denying the vote because of race. But by 1920, lawmakers in the South and in the West had set in place hurdles that while silent about race on their face had the net effect of disenfranchising many black Americans. Poll taxes, literacy tests and grandfather clauses had effectively kept many black men from casting their ballots since the 1890s. Unchecked intimidation and the threat of lynching sealed the deal. Local voting officials effectively constructed a color line without ever invoking race. So did American women win the vote in 1920? Not all women. African-American women in too many states became mere equals to their fathers and husbands. State laws disenfranchised them now in an end run around the spirits of the 15th and 19th amendments. Registration numbers reflected the effects of discriminatory laws in the fall of 1920, black women presented themselves to voting officials, but many found the books closed. Now, at the same time, the first waves of black women voters had been unleashed as individual states made women's suffrage the law there. In California, starting in 1911, Illinois in 1913, in New York in 1917, black women in important numbers were already experienced voters by 1920. Even more managed to register and cast ballots in the fall of 1920 in the wake of the 19th Amendment. One example comes from St. Louis, Missouri, where Black women set up their voting headquarters at the city's Black YWCA, the Phyllis Wheatley branch, named for the 18th century enslaved poet. There, Black women ran a suffrage school and prepared for their chance to register, teaching one another how to pay poll taxes and pass literacy tests, even when administered by begrudging officials. Women studied the Constitution together, ready to explain even its most complex causes to voter registration officials. They turned out 
and papers reported that nearly every woman in the city of St. Louis registered that season, black and white. Why turn out for black women? Well, in St. Louis, segregation had gained traction after a spring 1916 loss at the polls. The black owned St. Louis Arg Argus railed, prejudice wins election, St. Louis adopts segregation, Negroes badly disappointed. The next fall in 1917, when black men showed up to vote for president, police arrested them at the polls on for false charges. 3,000 never cast ballots and another 900 were never counted. The handiwork of Democratic Party ballot robbers. There, the black women in the YWCA began in 1919, that June, just as the 19th Amendment went out for ratification by the states, they went ahead with their suffrage school. And by the winter of 1920, the Argus was praising black suffragists. Race women will soon become powerful political voters. When the last state, Tennessee, ratified the 19th Amendment in August 1920, black women in St. Louis were ready. A counterexample comes from Daytona, Florida, where educator and National Association of Colored Women's Clubs leader Mary McLeod Bethune was traveling the state in 1920 to encourage black women to register, only to be confronted by brutal opposition each step along the way. Black women in Florida managed to join the voter rolls, but the intimidation continued. In Daytona, on election eve, white-robed Ku Klux Klansmen marched onto the grounds of Bethune's girls' school there after assembling downtown. Their objective, to scare black women voters, Bethune, her faculty, and the women of Daytona more generally away from the polls. They were not successful that year. When the next day, black women turned out they did so in remarkable numbers. And we learned something else about their strategies and tactics. Turning out en masse together helped to stave off the intimidation and violence that attended election day 1920 in Daytona and across Florida. Um, this sort of courage comes to characterize the exercise of voting rights in the state. Now, it won't be the last time that Mrs. Bethune and her school will be visited by the Klan. Um, the Klan will return on election eve in 1922, again to the campus of Mrs. Bethune's school, today's Bethune-Cookman University. Um, here, um, African-Americans um, understand that the violence and intimidation that had characterized these years was Un, going to go unabated, um, Mrs. Bethune um, develops a kind of political um, savvy um, that is near legend in these years. Um, she confronts the Klan yet again, but then will head by the 1930s to Florida. Um, we'll revisit this later chapter in her life a little bit later. But let's stay in 1920 for a moment because like the women in St. Louis and in Florida, um, black women across the country are all too aware that they are continuing to be disenfranchised despite the federal amendment that made states um, give up their sex requirements when it came to voting rights. Black women um, are organized politically, some 300,000 of them by 1920 under the auspices of the National Association of Colored Women. With clubs throughout the nation, these women are charged with now charting a route forward in 1920, looking still to win a guarantee of voting rights for all African-American women. The NACW in that year was headed by Hallie Quinn Brown of Ohio. Hallie Quinn Brown um, was an educator. Uh, she was an elocutionist. She was a church activist who had cut her political teeth in the AME or African Methodist Episcopal Church at the end of the 19th, at the end of the 19th century when 
um, she had run for the head of the church's education board. It was part of a broader dust up in which church women brought the politics of the vote um, to bear on governance in religious communities. Um, Hallie Quinn Brown wanted to hold office. Um, her sisters in the AME church wanted preaching licenses and to be ordained to the ministry. Um, Hallie Quinn Brown understood well what women's rights could mean, what women's political power could mean, both in the realm of the sacred and the secular. By 1896, when the National Association of Colored Women was founded, Hallie Quinn Brown was um, now going to not only be there for the founding, she was going to be among those um, who um, lead, led the organization. Um, by the early 20th century, um, she is head of the suffrage department in the NACW, where her politics includes, yes, um, the call for women's votes, but also includes, for example, the important campaign to win anti-lynching legislation in Congress. The NACW is, in essence, the strongest corollary for African-American women to organizations like the National American Women's Suffrage Association and the National Women's Party later on. Um, this is where black women come together, not only to develop their political agenda, but to hone their strategies and tactics as they move forward. So Hallie Quinn Brown in 1920 is now the president of the NACW and her organization um, comes together to chart out a new course and they are determined now to look to Congress um, for federal legislation that will in essence override those state laws, the poll taxes, the literacy tests and more, looking for federal legislation that will give teeth to the 15th and the 19th amendments and get all black women across the country to the polls. Uh, Brown looks for allies and among them um, she considers um, are the women of the National Women's Party headed by Alice Paul. Brown is an admirer as are many black women of Paul's radical suffrage politics, her political savvy and of the success of the campaign, um, the hard fought campaign for ratification of the 19th amendment. Brown's thinking is that a partnership between the NACW, the National Association of Colored Women and Alice Paul's National Women's Party might be just the way forward to win now federal legislation. And she calls on Alice Paul first in a letter um, in which she reminds Alice Paul that black women have been um, partners in the struggle for the 19th amendment. And she insists that the women of the NACW be included in what are going to be a series of celebrations in 1921. And indeed, um, Brown wins a place for African-American women at the February 1921 unveiling of a monument to early women's suffragists, a monument that is going to be unveiled um, in the Capitol Rotunda that February. Um, it is a monument to Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, and Lucretia Mott, and the NACW women will participate in the pageantry of the unveiling um, with a delegation, a banner, um, flower girls. Um, it is an important moment for Brown, um, whose work has long been to ensure that African-American women too have a place at the table when it comes to voting rights politics. But Brown hasn't come to see the National Women's Party only to uh, win a place in this pageant, she has also come to do political business. And along with a delegation of women from the NACW, behind the scenes, she calls upon Alice Paul, imploring Alice Paul to join with her in this campaign now to win federal legislation. Now the precise nature of their exchange um, has not survived. 
um, but we know from the record what happens next. Um, Alice Paul in the winter of 1921 will convene the last of the conventions of the National Women's Party. The organization will fold up and Alice Paul will move on by 1923 to call for and become the champion of a next amendment to the federal constitution, an equal rights amendment, an amendment which by the way, um, is still slowly and unevenly making its way um, to ratification even today. But African-American women um, here are left behind now to craft the terms of a new movement, one that will indeed win them federal legislation. And it is a movement that will um, unfold over the next four and a half decades, 45 years until 1965, when Congress and President Lyndon Johnson will finally um, pass um, and sign into law um, the Voting Rights Act in that year. How did Black women get from the disappointments of 1920 to the victory of 1965? Um, Hallie Quinn Brown and the women of the National Association of Colored Women um, are um, very much at the center of that story. It begins with politics and the ground game of politics. Um, just as African-American women had in 1920, um, they continue in the years to come with the necessary in the trenches work of voter education, of registration, of turnout, of the resistance to laws and the resistance to illicit violence and intimidation, um, black women continue to do that critical work such that as many of them as possible are at the polls in every election cycle after 1920. Perhaps the best example um, comes out of um, the 1920s in the city of Florida, uh, excuse me, in the city of Chicago in Illinois, um, where African-American women um, have been voting since 1913. Um, there, they will not only register and vote, um, Black women will join in important numbers and to great effect, the Republican Party, now affecting party platforms, the selection of candidates and more. They will elect an African-American Oscar de Priest, um, first an alderman in the city of Chicago. And by 1928, um, Black women's votes their organizing, their ground game in Chicago will elect Oscar de Priest to Congress, the first African-American man to be elected to Congress here in 1928 since 1901, nearly three decades. Um, this is part of black women's strategies to continue to stay in the trenches in every election cycle and to affect the outcomes where they can. At the same time, um, African-American women become part of the legal campaign, um, much of it waged by the NAACP um, that is chipping away incrementally but significantly at many of the impediments that are keeping black women and men from the polls after 1920. Challenges to the poll tax, challenges to grandfather clauses, challenges to whites only primaries. Um, this is the work of the NAACP in these years with black women on its board of directors, black women um, as um, members of the litigation team. Um, the NAACP legal campaign is critical to getting black Americans to the successes of the 1960s. And then of course, there are those African-American women um, whose courage, um, whose vision, um, whose savvy, um, whose um, brilliant um, leadership um, gives us the victories of the modern civil rights era. So here, um, the grassroots campaigns um, that are waged by um, women through organizations like the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, 
the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and more, um, these women um, are um, the better remembered figures in a phase of the voting rights movement that comes to incorporate hundreds and eventually thousands upon thousands of African-American women who now will put not only themselves, but their reputations, their livelihoods and their bodies on the line in the movement that finally will force the hand of Congress, will finally force the hand of Lyndon Johnson and result in the ratification of the 19, oh, excuse me, um, the passage of the Voting Rights Act in 1965. That act is precisely the teeth filled legislation that Hallie Quinn Brown and the National Association of Colored Women had been calling for in 1920. And even as Brown and many women of the NACW will not live to enjoy the fruits of that victory, um, their groundwork in setting the terms of that campaign is felt all the way till 1965. Now today, the 19th Amendment continues to prohibit states from denying the vote based upon sex, just as the 15th Amendment forbids states from using race when determining voting rights. And still, many American women do not have the unqualified right to vote, as was true in 1920, merely where a woman lives, for example, a fact that often correlates with her race, where a woman lives may still keep her from the polls voter ID laws, shuttered polling places, the purge of voter rolls, exact match requirements. None of these strictures proclaim their intent to deprive black women or women of color from, of the vote. And still these along with policies that leave many of us still wondering, where will I cast my ballot? How will I cast it and will it be counted? Um, these sorts of questions in the context of a pandemic um, are all too eerily familiar. The history of the 19th Amendment for us today is far more than a myth. It is a cautionary tale for our own time. And at the same time, it would be a mistake to leave you with the sense that nothing had changed since 1920 because for African-American women, a great deal has. We see black women today in 2020 as um, a force in American politics. Let me offer you some examples of the way in which that force has been made manifest. Remember not so long ago in the uh, 2017 Alabama special election, that uh, brought Senator Doug Jones uh, to the US Senate in that year. Um, that was a, um, a close, highly contested contest for a seat in the US Senate, um, a body in which each and every vote counts. Um, and we know that African-American women in Alabama activated those very same old networks of clubs, of sororities, of YWCAs, of church organizations and more, the same sorts of networks that had worked for black women in 1920 in many places um, were activated in Alabama in 2017, sending the Democrat Doug Jones to the US Senate and flipping that precious Senate seat from red to blue. Um, this is um, an example, not unlike that of black women in the state of Illinois in the city of Chicago in 1928. This is an example of how black women continue to work the ground game of American politics in the trenches on election day and turning the tide in local, state, and even national contests. Now, some of you may already be casting your ballots 
in 2020. I'm going to do that tomorrow um, here in my home state of Maryland. Um, and when we look together at our fall 2020 ballots, um, part of what we might notice, should notice in my view, is that this year, somewhere between 120 and 130 Black American women are running for seats in Congress. Black women have set their sights on Washington in record numbers in 2020. Um, the high bar um, before this year had been set in 2016 when 48 Black women had run for Congress. Um, the numbers this year are record shattering. Um, and we understand how Black women have come not only to make themselves heard at the polls, but to make themselves heard on the floor of the national legislature, as well as within state and local governing bodies. They are indeed coming to be a force. And if you hadn't yet noticed those women down ballot quite yet, I think that very few of us have missed the candidacy of Florida's, uh, excuse me, California, I'm getting to Florida in a minute, California's uh, Senator uh, Kamala Harris, who is running this year on the Democratic Party's um, national ticket alongside Vice President Joe Biden. Um, Kamala Harris, um, uh, back in August of this year, accepted the Democratic nomination during the party's convention. Um, and perhaps you also saw that speech. Um, if you haven't, um, I'll recommend it on YouTube, but I'll share with you just a few of the highlights um, that underscore the significance, um, the relevance, um, the political traditions, um, the history out of which Senator Harris's candidacy has emerged. Now, she went out of her way during that speech to acknowledge the women on whose shoulders she stands, as she put it. The first was her mother. Um, and Senator Harris's mother, an immigrant to the United States from India, um, a researcher, and more, was a woman who instilled in her daughter's um, courage, um, ambition. Um, she encouraged them to set their sights high and Senator Harris paid a moving tribute to her own mother. And then she turned to the history of African-American women's politics. She turned to six women whom she named checked as foremothers, those who have undergirded, inspired, and give meaning to her political achievements here in 2020. And it's important to say that um, when Senator Harris reached back 100 years um, to acknowledge the women who had been in the struggle for voting rights when the 19th Amendment was ratified, um, she is reminding us that she and Black women office holders, Black women voters in 2020 were 100 years ago for many Americans, too many Americans, unthinkable, unimaginable, in fact. Um, and this, of course, is an effort to give us a sense of how far African American women have traveled in politics over the course of 100 years. So who were those women? Um, the first was Mary Church Terrell. Um, Terrell um, was the first president of the National Association of Colored Women. Uh, she was probably as staunch a black suffragist as we um, could point to in the years leading up to the 19th Amendment. And she was a fascinating figure in part because Cher Terrell um, was deeply committed to um, always keeping a place for black women at the table of suffrage politics, even as she and women like her confronted anti-black racism within the movement. She is someone who turned out for Alice Paul's 1913 
um, suffrage parade, um, even as Black women were discouraged from participation there. She is the only Black woman who, along with her daughter Phyllis, participated in the 1917-18 pickets at the White House that helped to turn Woodrow Wilson into a supporter of the federal amendment. So Mary Church Terrell um, was someone Kamala Harris invoked. She also invoked um, Ida B. Wells, um, the journalist with a sharp pen and a sharper tongue, um, who was um, the great initiator of the movement to win federal anti-lynching legislation in Congress. Um, Ida Wells was also a suffragist working in the city of Chicago um, across the color line with white suffragists and also within the club she founded, the Alpha Suffrage Club. These are the women whose organizing efforts lead to the election of Oscar de Priest in 1928. Kamala Harris invokes Ida B. Wells. Kamala Harris also invoked the women of the modern civil rights era, Diane Nash, the uh, great Southern Christian Leadership con con uh, Conference um, nonviolent activist um, who was um, not only the architect of the Selma voting rights campaign in 1964, um, but had been behind the scenes um, in the Nashville, Tennessee um, student sit-in uh, campaign, had been behind the scenes um, supporting the Freedom Riders campaigns. Um, Diane Nash was um, a brilliant strategist, someone who, um, did not often appear before the camera, um, but um, whose influence was widely and profoundly felt um, in the years leading up to uh, passage of the Voting Rights Act. There was Fannie Lou Hamer, um, appeared to Diane Nash in any way, many ways, but whose story contrasted um, notably. Um, Hamer had begun her life as a sharecropper um, she became an organizer for the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Um, she had paid dearly um, with her um, bodily well being, um, with her livelihood, for her voting rights activism in the state of Mississippi. By 1964, Fannie Lou Hamer had become, I think, um, a, a true um, brilliant strategist in front of the camera. She understood how to use um, the photographer's lens, be it still or moving, to great effect, how to bring the movement, its claims, its concerns, its people into the living rooms of all Americans, whether on the pages of their newspapers or on their television screens. Fannie Lou Hamer led in 1964 um, the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party's uh, Black delegation to the Democratic National Convention. And there she decried not only the Mississippi, the all white Mississippi delegation, but the Democratic Party more generally for having um, seated representatives who had been selected without the consultation of Black Mississippians this is a speech Hamer gives on national television. Um, and it is a game changer in that now the Democratic Party is, um, has their feet held to the fire. Um, and um, Hamer's message, um, Hamer's um, objectives are ones that will not fade even as the cameras um, are turned off. Kamala Harris invoked Constance Baker Motley, a member of the NAACP's litigation team um, in the years leading up to uh, passage of the Voting Rights Act. Um, Motley will go on herself to be a candidate for office in New York City, um, where she will serve um, locally, and then she will represent the city in the uh, New York State Legislature. Um, and finally, she will be appointed to the federal bench where in a life 
long appointment in New York, she will be responsible now for enforcing the civil rights victories, including the Voting Rights Act that had been um, part of that litigation campaign. I've saved Mary McLeod Bethune for last um, because of um, who we are and where we are gathered. But the sixth name um, on Kamala Harris's short list of sheroes was indeed Mary McLeod Bethune. And we've heard something about Mrs. Bethune's early activism as an educator and as a suffragist in the state of Florida. But where we left off with her, um, we know that she was um, necessarily someone who turned away um, to an important degree from local politics um, to come to Washington, um, where Mrs. Bethune, um, I think, just underscores um, her political um, savvy and insight um, when she um, founds the National Council of Negro Women, um, befriends um, Franklin Roosevelt and his wife, Eleanor, helps to found the president's black cabinet in 1936 and gives us a model for how black Americans go about winning and exercising political power despite disenfranchisement in the 1930s and 40s. Mrs. Bethune understands expertly the power of patronage, for example, and uses her position within the administration to bring many, many Black Americans, especially Black American women, into Washington, into the New Deal agencies that are working to recover the nation from the depression and with the presence of Mrs. Bethune and her colleagues now using those resources to help black Americans come out of the devastating effects of the depression. By 1945, um, Mrs. Bethune will be among the delegates to the San Francisco meeting that founds the United Nations and there she will fully discover that the concerns that she has long championed, those of black American women, um, those of the problems and the challenges of Jim Crow um, resonate powerfully with women of, of color from across the globe, um, whether they are combating um, India, uh, in India, uh, colonialism and a caste system, or South Africa and colonialism and apartheid. Um, this and more becomes the new circle of influence um, and a new frame for Mrs. Mrs. Bethune's work in the National Council of Negro Women in the 1940s. Um, she lives a long arc of a life from 1875 to 1955, um, like Mary Church Terrell and Ida Wells, not living long enough to um, see the passage of the Voting Rights Act, um, but long enough to have planted um, the remarkable seeds um, that create the women activists who follow them and see through the important work they had begun at the dawn of the 20th century. I'll leave you with one last thought if I could and it is one um, about um, how to frame um, the challenges of our own time. Um, very recently, I had an opportunity to speak at the National Civil Rights Museum um, with my colleague and friend, Dr. Noel Trent there. And Dr. Trent asked me a question that I um, think I will never forget. Um, when speaking about um, the history of Black women's voting rights activism, the work across centuries and generations, um, she said one question for our own time is this, um, for us, it is this, um, what, what kind of ancestor, what kind of ancestor will you be? Um, and here, um, I think it's a poignant reminder that um, the women who I'm invoked this evening um, from 100 years ago in the trenches of voting rights struggles 
um, understood that politics was a long game, understood that they would not all live to see the kind of transformations that they were calling for. Um, and yet um, they were accountable, um, not only to their own political moment, um, but for the political futures of their daughters um, and their granddaughters and beyond. Um, so today, I think um, I'll leave you what that, with that same question as we um, are confronted with the challenges of 2020, um, what kind of ancestor will you be? And with that, I'll say thank you very much. And I believe that Connie Lester, Dr. Connie Lester will um, rejoin me um, I hope so. And um, we'll have an opportunity for some questions and um, some uh, discussion. So thank you all again very much for the honor of speaking with you this evening. And hello again, Connie. Hi, and thank you so much. Um, this gives us many, many things to think about. And so while we're waiting for people to, uh, to bring their questions to the forefront, uh, I have a couple of questions on, of my own, sure. sort of general questions while people are thinking of, of more specific questions. But I know in our audience tonight, we have a number of students um, who are listening. And um, they, uh, what I would like to ask you on their behalf is, is how um, did you come to this subject? What were the challenges of, of writing the book, Vanguard. I know I always tell students that it, there are two types of problems. One type is when you are overwhelmed with sources and the other type is where you have to tease them out wherever you can find them. So would you talk about the process of, of writing Vanguard and, and what challenges you faced? Sure, thank you for that question. And, um... <sighs> For me, um, my research questions always come out of some kind of itch I need to scratch. There's a problem, a dilemma, something um, I want to figure out, something I want to resolve. And so that's important to say. Um, this book began a few summers ago um, when a, a colleague passed along to me a news item um, that described a, uh, the plan for a monument um, to early women suffragists um, that was going to be installed in New York City Central Park for the August 2020 anniversary of the 19th Amendment. And um, so uh, I looked at the plans and quickly discerned um, that the proposal was for a monument to two women, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan Anthony, um, and that Anthony and uh, Stanton would then be seated with a scroll that kind of unfurled at their feet with the names of other suffragists. And as a historian of African-American women, I thought, uh-oh, um, we are now preparing for this anniversary year and could it be that we're in danger of having African-American women's roles, views, activism, and more um, be overlooked? And um, so um, I weighed in through an op-ed on this monument and much to the credit of the planners in the city of New York, it, it, in my view, it was amended and um, the figure of a peer to Stanton and Anthony, Sojourner Truth, um, the formerly enslaved woman who was an abolition, abolitionist and women's rights advocate, um, Sojourner Truth was added to the monument and it's in Central Park today. Um, but I, a historian's way of kind of really answering that dilemma and ensuring um, that uh, the history um, that concerns her gets on the table um, is by writing a book um, or an article. And so in this case, I sat down to write Vanguard and I had um, an advantage in the sense that I had written um, about black women's 19th century politics before. Um, so while those archives are 
um, challenging and um, not always as robust as they it, we, we might like them to be. I um, was familiar enough with them and I knew that we had a great deal um, of writings directly from black women and that I would be able to tell some of their stories in the early part. What I had no experience with really was the 20th century. And the 20th century turns out to be the inverse of this problem I had in the 19th century, which is that there was so much material. Um, I wasn't sure I could do justice to it. Um, so I now understand why my colleagues work in the 20th century. Um, and, um, and it was a challenge to be as selective as I had to be um, in what is a um, 360 page book um, but all throughout, um, my goal was to um, feature women um, who had left some trace of their own ideas, their own activism, um, and to build on the three generations of Black women's historians um, who had preceded the writing of Vanguard. Um, I know students don't always like to spend time in the footnotes. Um, but I would say with this book, have a peek at the footnotes just to appreciate um, how rich and far ranging the literature on African-American women's history, particularly their political history um, already is. So thank you for that. Okay, so um, we couple of other questions now. Um, we'll come back to if we run out, but I'm encouraging people to, uh, to put their questions in. So we have a question uh, about what role uh, Black women played in the conversion of African-American voters from Republican to Democratic. Mm. It's an important part of the story. And of course, um, Mrs. Bethune is, a, is, is very much a part of that. Um, part of what we um, know about African-American women um, by the time, uh, oh, sorry, we have a little technical glitch here. There we go. Um, so um, by the time the 19th Amendment is ratified, um, in many places, Black women are um, savvy and discerning. Um, it would be a mistake to say that all um, Black um, Americans even support the Republican Party in the early 20th century. Um, there are important strains of um, criticism that um, are leveled at the Republican Party. Um, Black Americans by 1920 are um, importantly have been disappointed by the Republican Party, which has not given them the kind of influence, um, support, um, and opportunities that um, they aim for, especially after the 1890s. Um, so in some ways, um, the ground is laid for that shift by the party itself. But Black women um, in 1920 are going to be um, important operatives, um, um, creating a, um, a distinct um, association of Black women within the Republican Party. Um, but their criticism, um, their ongoing criticisms and disappointments of the party um, uh, are added, if you will, to those of African American men. Um, and Mrs. Bethune is an example of someone um, who um, reads the um, opportunities um, in Washington in particular um, and will. Um, helped to shift alliances importantly, um, especially through um, the, um, the New Deal um, era, the critical role that federal agencies are playing. Um, there's a whole new facet of government um, that gives Black Americans the opportunity to come to Washington um, in official roles and, um, and exercise influence. Um, so in the book, I write about this generation of Black women who come to Washington um, in the 30s and into the 40s. Um, they are now college educated women, um, some of them um, educators, others of them social workers, um, and they are um, not only um, part of the 
party alliance shift. They are part of that shifting of the balance of power in Washington, if you will, away from Congress and to the federal agencies um, where they will weather the tide um, well, um, whatever the ruling regime might be. Um, I think that's still the case until today. So thank you for that. So we have a, another question here. Um, and this question asks, how do we move from achieving the addition of the term equal into the statement of legal rights to achieving actual equality, both gender and racial? Well, that's, that's quite a question. <laughs> um, uh, I'll say a couple of things. I think one, um, is that the women I write about um, are uh, committed to their equality, um, but they would um, add um, to that in another essential term and that is dignity. Um, and so um, African-American women as they define their um, political objectives, um, look at equality before the law um, but they are as um, committed to winning dignity in their everyday lives. Um, and they are there to do so, um, they come to politics to do so, not only on behalf of themselves, um, but as many of them will say, they really come to um, do that work and insist on those principles um, out of an interest in serving all of humanity. Um, so these are um, ambitious goals. Um, maybe um, the easy answer is to say um, that they are always um, aspirations, um, which is to say that um, part of what I learned in writing Vanguard is that each generation comes to define what it means by ideas like equality and dignity. Um, these are not fixed um, or um, um, immutable principles, um, but they are principles that respond um, very much to the times um, and to the context. Um, so the women I write about um, are committed, um, as I've suggested, um, across um, generations um, and they pass on um, not only knowledge and savvy and skills, they pass on, pass on structures and organizations and relationships um, to a next generation. And I don't think for African-American women, um, we could say at all um, that um, the notion is to um, merely to arrive um, because um, there is always a, a community um, there is always a constituency. Um, there is always a concern um, that will um, challenge and animate Black women's politics um, such that I, I don't know that I quite, if I could quibble with the question, think that the goal is to win equality. The women I write about are visionaries because they continue to set a high bar and if in one generation, what the high bar meant was, for example, the abolition of slavery, um, in the next generation, it meant winning fundamental citizenship. In next generations, um, the battle of Jim Crow um, and so forth. Um, by the time we get to the second world war and the modern civil rights era, now full political rights, and onward. And I think where we are um, is at a moment where now um, part of what equality and dignity and the rights of humanity will mean for Black women um, will be defined through their increasing capacity to, for example, affect lawmaking in Washington as well as in state and local legislatures. And that chapter, in my view, um, is really just beginning. Um, so um, maybe it's too simple a thing to say, stay tuned. Um, but I think Black women, um, as their influence increases, um, we will see the ways in which they will shape 
um, the national agenda, public policy, law, and more. Um, and that will give us yet a new definition of some of those uh, key terms. So when you were talking uh, about uh, Mary McLeod Bethune, you opened a door that I hope you'll explore a little bit more. And that was talking about the way in which she was, um, she was part of the, of the discussion and the, and the opening up of the United Nations. Um, and so the question uh, that I have for you is, in, in what ways do you see black women and women of color globally at a, at a crossroads at which, uh, which is a term you used in your book, uh, black women being at the crossroads. Um, how do you see that and the ability of uh, at least American black women to, um, to organize? How do you see black women acting on a global uh, platform? Yeah. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, you know, one of the um, bits about Mrs. Bethune's um, experience in San Francisco is that um, the men in her delegation, um, W.B. Du Bois and Walter White, um, are not as welcoming or as embracing of her as she might have liked. Um, and it tells us something about um, how women are thrust together. She finds alliances um, with this extraordinary cross-section of um, African-American, no, excuse me, of um, women from across the globe. Um, and your question is about today. I guess um, one of the people I was thinking about um, was um, Susan Rice, um, who we know was on um, among that group of six African American women who are um, who were part of Joe Biden's shortlist um, this past summer, um, and so um, while the first Black woman diplomat is um, among the women who closes um, uh, closes Vanguard, Patricia Roberts Harris, who um, Lyndon Johnson appoints um, as ambassador to Luxembourg in 1965. Um, today, um, diplomats like Susan Rice um, are representing the United States across the globe. Um, we could point to Condoleezza Rice as well as someone who has served in that role as, um, as Secretary of State. Um, so I think that these are, um, it, to some degree, um, at the head of um, um, state politics. And that's one, I think, measure of where African-American women, where they have arrived. Um, and at the same time, I think that um, it, my experience, um, for example, in um, the early uh, 21st century was around the roles that um, black women played, for example, um, in the world Congresses that convened around um, women and HIV and AIDS, um, importantly, um, a place, a, a scene, a series of, of meetings of Congresses, of collaborations and more um, where African-American women um, were now um, peers and partners and uh, colleagues um, with women across the globe, including um, women, um, importantly, of Africa in the ongoing work um, against uh, challenging um, the scourge that is HIV and AIDS still today. Um, we know that um, in the US, women of color, um, black women are disproportionately still um, affected by um, that, uh, that virus. And so um, women are coming together, black women, women of color are coming together ar across the globe um, through these kinds of, I think, important um, thematically driven um, approaches to um, world problems, um, still through a kind of a model that I think the men at the United Nations who wanted to um, sort of play politics that was about sort of brokering and horse trading um, missed that Mrs. Bacla Mrs. Bethune brought from her experience in the, um, in the women's club movement 
um, had brought a kind of collaborative style and a cooperative style of leadership um, that I still think we can see um, framing those kinds of women's congresses, um, for example, around HIV and AIDS globally. Um, that I think too is part of the legacy, um, not only those, um, the recognition of common ground, but um, the recognition of, of shared styles of working um, politically um, internationally. Okay, we have another question. It's a little bit long, so <laughs> I'll, okay. I'll, I'll read it to you. Um, it, it asked, can you comment on what kind of material living condition improvements Black women achieved as a result of their uh, their political work and their organizational work. And um, the questioner provides an example, um, saying, I know uh, Fannie Lou Hamer was very concerned about improving the daily lives of black women in the Delta. So how did work like hers change black women's daily lives? Right. I think one answer to your question is not enough, right? And it's one of the lessons um, uh, about the limits of politics um, and electoral politics in particular um, to move the needle for African-American women um, still today on too many measures, um, health, wealth, um, housing, and more um, African-American women, um, despite the claim or the pitch that I made for black women as a force in American politics, um, how that force then works in collaboration and coalition um, with um, uh, legislators and more um, to move the needle, I think is that question for um, those women who are now becoming a force numerically um, through seniority and more um, in legislatures. This is, I think, the challenge that is in front of them. Um, I'm reminded, for example, of the ways in which um, that campaign for federal um, anti-lynching legislation that was um, inaugurated by Ida Wells at the close of the 19th century is still an open campaign within the US Senate today. And Senator Harris has been um, critical um, on this question. So I think that's one way of thinking about it, that um, finally, perhaps black women are entering a moment in which um, some of the longstanding concerns and inequalities um, are ones that they can um, make priorities when it comes to lawmaking in Washington in particular. I think that's one answer. And I think the other answer might be that um, a reflection on what women's issues are um, and um, the, um, the mismatch, if you will, between um, a view of women's politics that uh, imagines black women's issues to somehow um, be women only issues. Um, but for example, um, something like the Affordable Care Act, um, I see as very much uh, a, 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 a transformation, at least it continues it, for as long as it continues, um, the Affordable Care Act is an example, I think, of the kind of vision that African-American women had um, going back a hundred years and more. Um, yes, healthcare, right? But healthcare, um, not only for black women or even for black Americans, right? But that sort of transformation in the fundamental structures of healthcare that speak to all of humanity, at least to all of Americans, um, I see that as an example of the kind of um, transformations that the women I read about in the early 20th century are um, pressing for. Um, and um, I, for one, um, hope um, that continues uh, going forward. 
Okay, we, we have a, another question that's pretty long and so I'm, I'm gonna to try to condense it and I hope I don't misrepresent the question. But um, the questioner uh, says that you um, have been speaking about the relationship between uh, black and white women who were, vote, who were uh, organizing for political change and, and for voting rights. And oftentimes they are antagonistic. They uh, are not working in working together very well. So the question is, um, in the 20th century, do they eventually join forces? Do you see that they join forces now? Or is it still an antagonistic kind of relationship? I suppose the answer to that question um, depends on where you ask it and of whom, right? It, it's an enormous question. So I, I'll try and, and talk about it um, through the lens of, of politics and voting rights um, and say that um, there is an important shift um, that unfolds after 1920 um, in the American South and it is the movement for interracial cooperation. Um, by the 1930s and into the 40s, um, those women who are um, the inheritors of the work of, of women like Hallie Quinn Brown, um, here I'm thinking of um, everyone from Mary McLeod Bethune to Nanny Helen Burroughs, um, Frances Harriet Williams and others um, in Vanguard um, who are able to importantly reset the terms of their political alliances with white American women. The suffrage movement was always premised in a kind of hierarchy um, that assumed that white American women would lead, um, that they would dominate, um, and that black women would be um, adjuncts and ancillary. Um, the movement for interracial cooperation has a different premise, um, which is not only that everyone has a seat at the table, but they occupy equal seats. It's a round table to just work the metaphor a bit. And um, interracial cooperation and the experience um, that black and white women have there um, is important and transformative for the political work that black women do um, during the interwar years and beyond. Um, so that's very important to um, point out. And that movement, while it begins in politics, um, has um, powerful implications um, within um, uh, national uh, Baptist and Methodist communities as well, um, where we will see important um, collaborations across the color line between black and white women. Um, how to answer that question today, I think, um, is a challenge, which is to say um, where and what would the measure be precisely, but I'll offer you one. Um, and it is um, uh, how women use their voting power um, in the 21st century in the United States. And um, part of what we know is that very little has changed since 1920. Um, African-American women did then um, and continue now to by and large deliberate, mobilize and vote as a block. Um, in the early 20th century for the Republican, with the Republican party and as the questioner earlier pointed out, um, will shift um, in the New Deal era to um, the Democratic party. So um, African-American women um, have and continue to vote as a block. Um, and white American women do not, at least not yet. Um, which is to say that African American women, um, as they deliberate, as they engage the issues and more, um, have more effectively um, or more, uh, more, yeah, more effectively um, worked through their identities. Um, and um, taking their perspective on issues um, from their vantage point as black women um, and white women in the United States um, 
do not vote as a block, um, do not discern the issues um, as women, um, um, or certainly not as women um, united. So um, I'll leave it to you to tell me if in 2020 um, that, um, that rift um, between white American women might um, resolve or the gap um, might close. I don't think I'm someone who can say um, but it is to say that still there is uh, an important distance between black and white women um, on election day. Okay, I'm going to uh, combine two questions that are out there. And again, apologies to the, to the people who posed the question, but I think they're related in some ways. So one is looking at the Democratic Party in the 1960s and Fannie Lou Hamer's presentation there and the reception she got. And the other is looking all the way into the 21st century in the Obama administration. And, and both seem to fo focus on, uh, on a question of, did the Democratic Party miss opportunities to, um, to address some of the issues that, that Black women have posed? Mm. Thank you for that. Um. It's hard to understate or to overstate what a difficult moment 1964 is for the Democratic Party. Um, and um, Mrs. Hamer's remarks um, before the Credentials Committee, um, which again are available on YouTube and I recommend folks who haven't seen them to view them. Um, some of you will remember perhaps that um, Lyndon Johnson calls a um, somewhat impromptu press conference um, that upstages um, Mrs. Hamer um, and um, as the television networks shift their coverage um, from the floor of the Credentials Committee to Washington where um, President Johnson makes his remarks. They come back later to broadcast the full um, content of her eight or so minutes. Um, In the Obama years, um, I really mark um, 2008 as a turning point, as an important turning point in the influence, the access, the, um, the possibilities for black women in um, party politics, um, you know, behind the scenes, um, someone like Lottie Shackelford from um, Oklahoma, um, oh, from Arkansas, excuse me, um, is um, not alone behind the scenes um, running the Democratic Party. Um, women like Donna Brazil are, are running political campaigns. I think it's um, by 2008, black women are um, insiders in the Democratic Party in a way that um, frankly, I don't think the party could have imagined in um, uh, 1964. Um, when confronted by Fannie Lou Hamer. Um, but even in 1964, um, there are black women delegates um, to that convention um, like Patricia Roberts Harris who go on to um, important careers in law and politics and more. Harris will be the next year um, appointed uh, um, uh, head diplomat to um, Luxembourg by President Johnson. Um, and so there were women like her, right, who contrast to Hamer in terms of their access in their influence. Um, so is there a missed opportunity? Um, I'm not sure that's the, that's the characterization I would um, offer, but I'll say this, that I think that overall, um, black women have played an important role in the Democratic Party by setting the bar high, first and foremost, by insisting that neither race nor sex should um, be a prerequisite or a determinant of one's access to political influence, to power, voting, office holding, and more. Um, uh, and um, that remains a, a, a live struggle, um, not only within the party, um, but for the nation as a whole. And so one of the roles that black women um, have long played is, is setting that high bar um, for American politics. In my story, I think if there's a missed opportunity, 
Um, it was um, the most poignant of the missed opportunities is frankly um, back um, in the early 20th century when um, white American women suffragists in the National American Women's Suffrage Party, um, suffragists in the National Women's Party had an opportunity to link arms with black American women to insist that if women were going to have the vote, then it would be by way of an amendment that would guarantee the vote to all women, um, an amendment whose text would have overridden the state laws that threatened to keep too many black women from the polls. Um, that I think um, in my story is um, the most profound of missed opportunities um, given where we are today and um, the understanding we have um, unequivocally about the scourge that anti-Black racism continues to be in our nation, um, I think that um, the failure for Black and white women um, to work together, the unwillingness of suffragists to embrace not only Black women, um, but their interests, their concerns, and their issues um, on the road to the 19th Amendment um, was really the missed opportunity of the last century. Thank you, Professor Jones. This has been so enlightening. You've given us so much to think about. I imagine there will be class discussions for the next week or so uh, over the things you've talked about today. Thank you very much. I know because we're on Zoom, you can't hear our applause, but we are applauding. Well, here's mine. Thank so, you. <laughs> thank you very much. And thank the audience for being with us tonight. And, um, and come back next year for the next Schaffner Lecture. Thank you. <laughs>